Welcome to Shades of Us, the show that looks at a person's journey when it comes to race and self-identity. I'm Tina Beth Pena. On today's episode, we'll feature an Irish Asian artist, a multi-hyphenate self-described Black Jew, and a Somali Irish poet. Shai Fan is the artist whose journey we'll explore first. My name is Shai Fan. I'm an artist. I'm half Vietnamese. My dad is full Vietnamese, and then my mom, uh, she's Irish, and then has Native American in her as well. People would think I'm just like a rich Asian girl, pretty girl. Everything's handed to me, uh, and that's not the case at all. Because like I didn't, I didn't grow up the Asian side of my family. I mean, my dad was never around, and so I think with that, like she wanted to like just forget about my dad. You know, race it was never like discussed. But I do remember one time I had to have a conversation with her. We was living in these apartments and it was just, um, she said something about like who I was hanging around. You know, I hung around a lot of black kids. She didn't want me hanging around that crowd because she thought they were bad. But I, I explained to her, I was like, I was like, you don't get it. I just got along with black kids because it's like, it was never like a race thing. Like we kind of like saw eye to eye. I was like, you don't have to deal with those type of things. Like, you don't have to deal with someone coming up to you and saying, those things, you know, like your blonde hair and green eyes. I've been doing art ever since I was, you know, could pick up a pencil, crayon, whatever. Um, really got into it, seventh grade, started painting. My art teacher kind of recognized my talent. We were doing a, a self-portrait. We had to paint with our fingers. And uh, I, I, I did really good <laughs> with my self-portrait. So after that, my art teacher, she just kind of challenged me a little bit more and more, doing more paintings, different techniques of paintings. I went to college for art education, ended up, you know, meeting a photographer, a local photographer, and he pretty much put me through like modeling boot camp. Ended up getting signed, and then I left Oklahoma. Like, I dropped out of school <laughs> um, and moved to New York. I did America's Next Top Model. I really loved it, I really enjoyed it, and it was always something I wanted to do. Like, I remember like as a little girl, like watching, I was like, yeah, like I'm, I'm gonna do that, like I wanna be on there, like I can do all of that. I know like I look different, and so like sometimes, yeah, I'll go to like a casting, it's just all Asian girls, you know, they have a type, and then it's like, oh. You, you kind of look Asian, but then like you're not Asian enough, you know? <laughs> or it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're not white enough. Like, <laughs> I was like, what? That's crazy. You're literally being judged every single day, just how you look, on based on how you look. And then you go and stand there, and literally you have no say in any of the creative process of what's going on. You don't have a name. You're the model. The model's here. I have a name. <laughs> So um, certain things like that, people knew me as a model. So it's like, now I'm trying to make this transition, you know? So it, it is like one reason I moved from New York, because I got to a point where it's like, I was seeing the love and the respect of me be, becoming an artist and, you know, everyone really enjoyed my work. So being an artist has always been me. You know, modeling fell into it, modeling was another, aspect of art and you know my path and learning you know to be comfortable with myself to like know my body like learn life like learn composition like learn form and just like kind of understanding myself a little bit more so when i create you know you you work with colors so it's like figuring out like what color palette to use like what kind of emotion do you want to bring out and you know ha have people feel my paintings like they're a piece of me you know so i'm putting a lot into it like i'm putting my energy into it so I'm trying to touch more into like the Asian side and like that culture um, because I don't know. And it's like, I do want to know more because I, you know, it is a part of me. And it's all a learning process, I guess. And I think that's why I want to connect a little bit more with the Asian side. So I can just like educate my mom, my brothers, you know, my nieces and nephews. And like, of course, like when I have kids, like I want them to like know certain things. And it's like, I want to be able to like explain. And I feel like, as a person to grow properly and to like understand yourself, you have to know your background. So I wanted to bring something onto the show. So I started brainstorming. I'm like, 
My nickname was Panda, you know, they're universal. So I started thinking of ways of how I can create this panda, but do it in a way that no one's done it before. So like skulls, I don't know why. I love skulls, like, I think they're fun. And I was like kind of combining those two and making a positive message. My fan base, they're called the pandas. Panda Nation has just kind of became like this family with people that support me, you know, bringing different cultures together. It's about diversity. Being honest, being open, it's all about being real. For my 4th of July party, um, I throw one every year. Literally like an hour before the event is supposed to start, we get shut down. And it was crazy, you know, I put it out there, I was telling people, and then within 30 minutes, I had another spot. You know, and it's just like that, like love and like support, it's like people like, all right, look, I got you. It was multiple people, it wasn't just one person came through. Other people hit me like, yo, check this spot out. Like, maybe you can sit up there, like, talk to this person. Like, you know, so it was like, it was amazing to like see that and like see people like actually work together to like make something happen. My band got to play, we got the food, we got the grill going, everyone had a good time. So it was, it was, it was really cool to like see that. The people that I surround myself with and like knowing it's like, all right, like, y'all got me, you know? Like we got each other, so. And a nation, that's what it's about, it's just like showing that real love. to meet a rabbi who shares his faith in many ways. Let me introduce you to Manish Tana. I tend to find myself in this sort of constant space of needing to explain either my Jewishness or my blackness or how I'm both. It's like, so where does it like intersect? How does your black become Jewish? It's like, no, it's been there literally the entire time. I, I can't really help you with that. My name is Manish Chana, and I'm a writer, speaker, and I suppose activist around racial and religious identity and how those uh, intersect and manifest in America, particularly around American Judaism. I'm used to the questions questioning the existence of my Judaism in the first place. How are you Jewish? Fine, thanks. How are you, Jewish? <laughs> On my mother's side, uh, we've been here, African-American and Jewish, since the uh, 1780s. My dad converted through Chabad in like the late 70s, and they had the five of us. You must be a very interesting person. Like, was there a theme song playing somewhere that everyone else could hear but me? He once caught a live gefilte fish. At the center, Eliyahu leaves a cup out for him. He once turned Manashevitz into wine. He is the most interesting Jew in the world. Machaya, my friends. I was originally trying to be a, a screenwriter. And uh, I figured, well, you know, there's not a lot of uh, media materials about, you know, the African-American Jewish experience. So let me, let me write that. Thoughts from Unicorn, 100% black, 100% Jewish, 0% safe was sort of my culmination of the blogging I'd been doing at that point for about only four years. And just a collection of like social observations and, and essays, a little bit of autobiographical anecdotes trying to bring to the public consciousness that existence of being black and Jewish. I mean, a very interesting reaction that I got once. Again, the full titles, the subtitle is 100% black, 100% Jewish, 0% safe. And someone looked at that and said, wow, that's so true, you're, you're not safe anywhere. And I thought, well, that's, that's an interesting take. I meant that I was the thing that wasn't safe for other people. <laughs>
So I started blogging to sort of, you know, gradually bring out these threads and things. And so that sort of uh, led to speaking engagements, it led to uh, writing for online magazines, and uh, here we are. So anyway, G Bro comes over to me, he's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, hey, and he's like, so are you really Jewish or are you just playing it around? And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> am, I, am I really Jewish just playing around? Are there, are there people that do that? <laughs> like, is there just like a flock of black people somewhere going, you know, I'm, I, just, I just don't feel oppressed enough. Like, <laughs> When it comes to speaking to different audiences, I, I kind of approach it like stand-up, where you, you start with this general basic thing that everyone can you know, relate to. It's about getting people relaxed in the space, because if they're resistant, then they're just never going to hear anything you have to say. There are too many Jews that are getting stopped at the gates and not being left alone to be their Jewish in Jewish spaces. Jews are different observance levels, LGBTQI Jews, Jews by choice, and in my life experience, Jews of color. I never really set out or desired at any point in life to be a rabbi. It just sort of happened organically. I would be getting uh, sought out to answer questions, either from like unaffiliated Jews, uh, unaffiliated mainstream white Jews, or just general Jews of color who either, one, weren't really uh, involved in community to have sort of a, a rabbi to go to, and two of the ones that were, either didn't feel comfortable asking their rabbi these questions or just knew that they weren't going to have the answer because they didn't have that cultural context, and so they'd ask me. Because this episode is the source of the halakhic rule that when someone says that they're Jewish, we do not investigate them. And so I had to go do all the research and you know the scholarship and find these sources and that source and come back to them with this answer, hear the sources. I don't particularly find it uh, to be part of my identity or particularly central to the work that I do. Uh, I think my mother feels otherwise because uh, when I told her that I was enrolling in rabbinical school, she's like, yeah, about time. I just did that like a decade ago. I was like, thanks, mom. It's like Jewish mom and black mom. When our pyros combine, or a force. I joined about two or three of the, the most popular sort of mainstream Jewish dating sites. One site never approved my profile at all. Just let it sit there and I looked back that it was gone. So the first question at this on the actual website was what's your ethnicity? Ashkenazi, Sephardi, or convert? Which was weird because I didn't realize convert was an ethnicity. So I answered none and I'm kind of weirded out that there's only three choices. Also, convert is not an ethnicity. So after hearing these kinds of stories, and I'm thinking they're terrible, I met my wife on a dating site for Jews of color that I created. Um, we didn't meet to date. Um, if anyone out there is old enough to remember MySpace, uh, I was the Tom of MySpace on on that website where people would join and I'd like friend them and interact with them and just try to create that sense of an organic online community. And I saw that she was beginning to work on a newsletter centered around biracial identity and, and multi-ethnic families. We met that first day for business, discovered we we're pretty much the same person and here we are, a marriage and a kid later. <laughs> I have definitely come across unkind reactions to being black and Jewish. It's, it's essentially like being black with more black added on. I've experienced less anti-Semitism in black spaces than I have racism in Jewish spaces, but there's definitely been different perceptions or assumptions or just nonsensical things said on both sides of the aisle. I definitely have recollections of the Crown Heights riots. Um, uh, my family was very uh, present in Crown Heights. We didn't live there yet. We were only we were a few blocks outside, but um, we knew a lot of the, the players and the victims. Um, when you'd see snapshots of someone Jewish in Crown Heights beat up and laying against the walls, like, oh, we know that guy. We pray with him. 
there's an entire uh, sort of like gatekeeping respectability that happens even among the same denomination. Judaism is a very interesting creature. People try to say it's religion, no, it's a race, no, it's a culture, no, it's an ethnicity. I think the definition that works most is it's a family. Judaism works the same way where there is a particular, you know, Semitic DNA ethnic group and that, you know, spread all over the world. Then there are people that convert in and there are people that, you know, get adopted and converted in and all these different, you know, ways that you can be Jewish. Where, but it's, so to try to classify it in this sort of way is, it's just not ever going to work. to choose between being black or white. And even if he doesn't want to choose, someone's gonna make him, right? And that somebody is me. No, here's why, because we're struggling financially, okay? So it's time for him to go to college. When that financial aid form comes, <laughs> I'm gonna check that box mark black. <laughs> Poetry speaks to everyone, and Safiya Jama uses her words as a powerful tool for self-expression. Let's take a look. Poetry was a very important doorway for me in coming to understand myself. My name is Safiya Jama. I am a native New Yorker. I grew up in a very diverse part of Queens. And so I didn't think much about what race I was, what my ethnicity was. That said, as I got older, people started to ask questions like, what are you? Where are you from? Actually, at a pretty young age, I came up with an answer. I said, I'm 50% Irish, 50% Somali, and 100% American. Usually it would get a laugh because it was like, oh, there, she's so cute. I started to become more conscious of the complexities of my background. What it meant to have a black father from East Africa and a white mother from Boston. There was a difference in religious backgrounds. My mother was raised Irish Catholic and my father was raised Muslim. It's quite mysterious to me though. Why, why poetry? It just is. I like to think that because of my Somali heritage, my ancestors passed some of their poetry onto me um, because Somalia is known as the land of poets. My mother loves poetry and would sometimes recite lines of Emily Dickinson around the house there's no one thing that inspires poetry or writing or art. It's more of a state of mind and a state of keeping one's eyes open and one's mind clear. A big part of my creative arc through this life was meeting Vincent. He plays wonderful music on so many different instruments and it's always around me. So I've been living in America now for 11 years. Um, growing up in Ireland, the concept of race or interracial uh, unions, it's, it's a, it was a rare thing. I didn't really understand uh, what race meant, what it means in America. Most of my understanding of it has been through Sophia, explaining to me or trying to educate me, you know, about what she experiences as a, as a woman of, of color. I think when it comes to drawing upon each other as artists, it's never one particular exchange. I want to be there and cheer her on and encourage her. I think that when I first read the poetry of Natasha Trethaway, I was really happy 
to see the graceful way that she writes about her heritage, navigating a mixed race background very much as a black woman. I have two poems in mind that speak to the connection between my poetry and my identity. The first is My White Mother Makes Lemon Meringue. And the second uh, is called On Hearing Odetta Sing This Little Light of Mine. And that was a poem that I wrote that was inspired by meeting the great folk singer Odetta, who was African American, was trained in opera, but in the early 60s fell in love with folk music. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Who am I to say what her life was about? I didn't live it. I wasn't born in Jim Crow, Alabama. I only visited my white son of a preacher boyfriend who drove me out to the woods to a barbecue shack filled with hunters, their guns watched us eat. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I absolutely think that activism is an important part of my work. I read some poetry for Queen's Writers Resist. It is a reading series that's based here in Jackson Heights. It started shortly after the last presidential election in direct response to that. As a child, I had a book of African-American folk tales called The People Could Fly, which is gathered by Virginia Hamilton. I love that book because it's, it specifically addresses slavery and, and the pain that people suffered here in America. I want us to get better at talking about race and racism. I'm teaching uh, undergraduate writing at Baruch College. I do bring the novella Passing. It's by Nella Larson, writer of the Harlem Renaissance. I find it's a fascinating book. It's a historical moment where black people of mixed heritage would sometimes pass as white and leave their segregated communities and enter into another segregated community to the point where they cut off ties to their relations. I don't think that we can truly have a full educational experience without delving into at least some poetry, some fiction, alongside the essays and the uh, scholarly article. If I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what my creative legacy will be, I would probably have writer's block. I used to paint self-portraits a lot because when I was younger, I would look in the mirror and I didn't know what I saw. I didn't know who I was. Now when I look in the mirror, I feel proud. I see a, a grown-up woman, a black woman, uh, a mixed race woman, a Somali woman, an American woman. I see a poet, a teacher. Yeah, I see a lot. <laughs>I look at my surroundings to see the type of person I may need to become in order to capture a particular role. There are many identities for me to take on, but that's for the stage. Life outside my craft is different. I know who I am as an actor and as a person. My name is Amadis Rodriguez, and I am Afro-Latino. That's our show for today. For more information on any of the people you just saw, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu. I'm Tina Beth Pina, and thanks for watching Shades of Us.